Good morning. It's May 12th, 2023. We're starting to finally warm up with a little bit more consistency and uh, frequency. So that means grass growth is really starting to take off and the frustration of mowing more frequently than you would like is probably there for some people. For other people, the therapy of being out on your lawn for 30 minutes of uninterrupted noise making and peace and quiet uh, becomes all the more valuable. Uh, online today for OSU Turfgrass Team Times, we've got Pamela Schratz, Dr. Dave Gardner, and Dr. David Shetler. Um, Dr. Gardner, take it away with news and updates on the weed science front. All right. I was going to say good morning, but it occurs to me that uh, some people might end up watching this when it's not morning. Anyway, um, let's see a little bit about weeds. Uh, trying to get my PowerPoint to actually work here. So um, a lot of our winter annuals at this point are starting to look like this, right? Which means that there's not much of a point in attempting to control them with a post-emergence herbicide. They're getting ready to die on their own. But um, if you did attempt to control those with a post-emergence herbicide and that didn't work well for you, it could be that you know temperatures are a little bit cooler, which makes it harder for herbicides to work well, or Winter annuals are sometimes just more difficult to control. In any event, if you had trouble with these, um, now's a good time to map them out so that, you know, I always say it's better to try to control those with a pre-emergence herbicide in the fall or a post-emergence herbicide in the fall. So again, if you had issues with winter annuals and you didn't have a lot of success controlling those this spring, again, make plans now to attempt to control them uh, later this year. Had a lot of calls about uh, identifying strange grasses in lawns, which is something that usually occurs in the month of April, early May. Um, you know, Kentucky bluegrass takes a little bit longer to green up and start growing relative to some of our other grasses, like rough bluegrass, for example. Um, but the good news is, is that a lot of these grasses that stood out in April and early May are now going to start blending in a little bit more. Um, that's the good news. The bad news, of course, is that there continues to be basically no selective control options for things like rough bluegrass. You have to uh, apply glyphosate and then uh, reestablish uh, in the fall. Um, the month of May is typically when we uh, concentrate on broadleaf weed control, right? And, you know, for dandelion and clover, just about every herbicide on the market will uh, um, do a relatively competent job on those plantains, too. Um, the weeds that I get uh, more calls about how to control are things like candidate thistle, wild violet, and you know the bad news is is that you know those those weeds are relatively difficult to control. Um, I usually recommend uh, some of the if you want to call it the um, more expensive products uh, for broadleaf weed control, some of the three and four way uh, herbicide um, mixes that uh, are also uh, you know you, you get what you pay for. They tend to be more effective. So you know things like Speed Zone, Momentum Four Score, T Zone, Four Speed XT, Sure Power. I think I mentioned at least one example brand from each of the major chemical companies. I didn't mean to exclude you if I did. Um, but anyway, my point is is that these contain usually a Protox inhibitor and then Dicamba or Triclopyr or both, and so they tend to be more effective on those more difficult to control weeds. Another one is Creeping Charlie, which you know is starting to uh, bloom and look really nice if you're into uh, that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, for most of us that are trying to get rid of it, it's another one of those weeds that's frustratingly difficult to control. So, you know, creeping charlie, wild violet, thistle, um, you know, a lot of those, if you just use a standard three-way formulation, 2,4-D, MCP, P, and dicamba, you know, sometimes you can get great control with those, you know, kind of like what this chart shows, but I did this three years in a row. Another year, it's like it ended up kind of working, but it took a longer time for it to work. And then there was another year that it's like it kind of worked and then it didn't work. Um, so, you know, the control with a standard three-way formulation with the more difficult weeds can be frustratingly inconsistent. And so that's why I recommend if you have a lot of those types of weeds to invest in um, some of those products that contain, um, you know, the, the Protox inhibitor, um, you know, like the ones that I had mentioned before. Um, you know, looking, we usually for uh, ground ivy in the past have recommended uh, triclopyr, um, but there is a, a newer herbicide on the market called uh, Sure Power um, that uh, contains flumioxazin. And uh, it actually works really, really well on ground ivy, but you have to be careful with that product. If you use it in the month of May, you tend to get a lot of uh, tip burn on the turf grass. Flumioxazin is uh, um, kind of hot on newly emerging uh, grass leaf tissue, but if the grass is hardened off um, in the summertime, so you know the months of June, July, and August, so long as it's green but not actively growing, um, that phytotoxicity is a lot less. So 
Um, you know, sure power is something that uh, is uh, certainly, uh, you know, something to consider if you're having trouble with ground ivy. Now, I want to mention real quick that uh, um, Dr. Nangle and I, Dr. Nangle's taking the lead on this project, are uh, starting to look at uh, this idea of nomo may, um, which was, uh, I think that phrase was coined in England, if uh, uh, memory serves. And, you know, uh, the idea there is that uh, you're supposed to not mow and you're supposed to allow um, um, certain weed species to grow up and produce flowers, and then that'll be more attractive to pollinators and et cetera. The thing is, is that I think things bloom at different times um, in that part of the world than they do here. Um, I note that uh, our most prevalent lawn weeds, uh, dandelions, uh, the peak bloom is in April. Um, and for the clovers, uh, the peak bloom is in June and July. And so in May, it's like neither of those are really blooming all that much. And so, you know, by not mowing, you're not really helping those to bloom more. Um, some of the weeds that uh, bloom more in the month of May would be things like the ground ivy, which I just got done mentioning, you know, we have a really hard time trying to control. The other thing that blooms in the month of May are the grasses. And so um, there's this intriguing idea that, uh, you know, if you let grasses um, bloom that that might be a source of pollen for bees. And I, I, I was intrigued by that idea. You know, um, that's the grasses are part of uh, the plant kingdom where um, it's the camelinid clade, if we want to get all nerdy. Um, but the whole point of that part of the plant kingdom is that uh, over uh, um, time, uh, the flower morphology uh, reduced. So there's no showy flowers to attract insects. There's no nectar to attract insects. You have much smaller pollen greens. And all of this is um, uh, for the purpose of facilitating wind pollination. But that's not to say that all of these plants um, rely solely on wind pollination. Come to find out, and you can find this in the literature, that there's one of our lawn grasses, centipede grass, where they have found evidence that um, um, bees do collect pollen from centipede grass. Those pollen grains are relatively larger compared to our cool season grass pollen grains, but um, I guess this is something else that we're going to look at um, when we're doing our nomo may research. But uh, you know, we're we're just in the very um, infancy of uh, this this project, attempting to uh, learn a little bit more about this idea. I drew a little bit of laughter from Ed, but anyway, that's that's my update for this week. <laughs> Dr. Gardner, thank you for reinforcing your point of view that you had with the discussion you and I had yesterday. <laughs> Grasses do not have bee pollination ongoing, according to Dr. Gardner. I disagree. I said a little, a small amount. Dr. Chetra, what say you? Yeah, I'm in the, the same boat. Uh, and as I uh, we had uh, preliminarily uh, discussed that most lawns that I've seen that have had any kind of maintenance uh, have a relatively low uh, dandelion population to begin with. And, and bees really like a high concentration of flowers if they're going to invest in going to a particular location and recruiting other bees to that location, they need quite a, bee, quite a few. And, and so uh, I'm not opposed if you wanna convert a little bit of your lawn in an additional flower bed uh, that that uh, you're planting uh, specific flowers that are attractive to bees. I think that's great and wonderful. I have no problem with that. But I think trying to to allow the or encourage the bees to come into your lawn is probably not uh, going to be all that productive. Uh, talking to to Dave's uh, concern. Uh, Dr. Reed Johnson and, and his postdoc, uh, Chia, have already done pollen count studies. They collect pollen from the bees that have been out foraging, and, and grass pollen is really down well below the percent level of what they're picking up. Um, surprisingly, uh, or at least it was surprising to me, I was amazed at the number of tree pollen uh, that, that they pick up. We just don't, uh, including oak, pollen. I, I just never imagined the flowers of an oak tree to be attractive, but they're picking that pollen up uh, and bringing it back as food. So flowering trees is probably a, a better way to go in, in, in your uh, urban landscape uh, than anything else. Well, I, I think the point, another point that I forgot to make was that, you know, given that dandelions bloom in April and clover primarily blooms in June and grass grows like crazy in May, if anything in Ohio, we should be saying it should be no mow April and maybe no mow June. Yeah. And then you mow in May 
Um, but again, we got to study all of this. Um, I, than... I, I did check. Uh, uh, my neighbor's got a big patch of uh, the creeping Charlie over there in full bloom. And I went over and just stood there for a while. And I think I saw one bumblebee that came by that, that was utilizing those flowers. I didn't see any of the honeybees. Uh, and, and people might say, well, do you have any honeybees? Yes, there's plenty of honeybees. I've got lots of plants in my landscape uh, that are in bloom right now, and the honeybees are working them over uh, quite well. So uh, they just weren't attracted. I, Creeping Charlie to me is a, a dastardly plant. I mean, all you have to do is walk across it and it stinks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's just... <laughs> I wonder if that smell of deterrent. Uh, Pamela Sherrod, speaking of all things English. I have a quick question for Dr. Gardner. So um, let's assume that um, some of the newly seeded areas are three to four weeks old now, um, mowed once maybe, something like a broadleaf plantain comes in aggressively. Uh, number one, my question would be, how soon do you think those could be spot treated? And number two, uh, apply it's very difficult to apply stuff this time of year because it rains so much but ideally should should those be applied to wet leaves or dry leaves for maximum efficacy i couldn't unmute myself i'm sorry um i think the wet leaves versus dry leaves um the more important thing is is how long does the leaf stay wet after the herbicide is applied and so it's not whether it's wet or dry at application, it's what are the weather conditions that are conducive to allowing that herbicide to penetrate into the leaf tissue. And so if it's like 80 degrees and sunny with low humidity, you've got like 15 minutes to get that herbicide into the, um, into the leaf. And so you wanna do it, um, you know, like more like on a day like this, but without rain in the forecast, you know, so kind of overcast and, you know, like maybe around 70 degrees or something like that. Um, to, to keep the herbicide in liquid form on the leaf for a longer period of time. Um, as far as when to make that application on a newly seeded lawn, most of your herbicides on the label, it says um, until the grass is sufficiently mature and you know the benchmark is it's been mowed three times. And so the question, um, it's been mowed once, we're having a weed problem, is that too soon to go in? Uh, the label would say yes. Um, I know that there's people that, uh, you know, try to get in there and uh, go a little bit earlier than that recommendation. And, you know, the problem is, is that that's going to vary by cultivar, weather conditions at application, the product used, the concentration of the product used. And so it's one of those, it's impossible to say whether or not that's going to cause damage to the grass, but there's an increased chance that it will cause damage to the grass were that product to be applied before the um, grass is mature as measured by that benchmark has been mowed three times. That was a really convoluted answer, I feel like. I'm sorry. No, that was very helpful. Thank you. Okay, so um, today I just wanted to talk a little bit about, I think I touched on the topic last week about our cool season grasses going into the stress period of summer and some of the things that we can do in the spring. So um, on sports fields right now, the grass is growing great. Um, uh, I would assume that quite a few, certainly the professional and NCAA guys, guys and gals are putting out, um, sports turf managers are putting out gr plant growth regulators. Uh, plant growth regulators are a great, great way to increase density, color, cut down on clipping uh, by about 50%. Usually this time of year, the grass is growing so aggressively from research that I've done in the past. I've started off at lower rates. Uh, I found so, just going in at the recommended rate, especially on something like ryegrass can cause some phytotoxicity. So if you're thinking about putting out a PGM this spring, maybe start off at the lower rates and build up to it. Um, typically in sports turf, because they're such under hard traffic, uh, the rates are usually half rate more frequently than full rate once a month, uh, but you will see improvement in density, uh, wear tolerance, color quality, leaf texture, and of course, clipping reduction. Um, another thing that's happening right now is obviously we get a lot of rain in the spring in Ohio, and that really does favor the shallow rooted grasses like rough bluegrass and annual bluegrass. Um, and what we've got to try and do this time of year 
is maximize the root growth of our desirable grasses like perennial ryegrass, Kentucky bluegrass on these sports fields, tall fescue. We've got to try and maximize the root growth of those grasses. And so um, judici very judicious watering this time of year um, and the same with applications of nitrogen because the nitrogen will favor leaf growth over root growth and rhizome and stolon growth. Um, you know, this weekend is Mother's Day, and this is the benchmark for putting your plants outside and planting your annuals. Uh, again, we wouldn't just go out, you know, I have, you would not be surprised, guys, I have about 100 house plants, and I won't just put them all out and that's it, because they aren't hardened off. So I will put my house plants out gradually over the next week, and we need to think about turf grasses the same. So we're trying to harden those turf grasses off leading into the summer stressful period. So very judicious watering. It's okay to let them be a little dry. Uh, very judicious nitrogen applications. If you're doing aeration and top dressing, my only word of caution there would be that we want to kind of minimize soil disturbance because we're getting into peak uh, crabgrass. Or crabgrasses are, are germinating. And so now is not the time to till the soil. Um, but if you are aerating and top dressing, that's another way to promote that gas exchange. If we can maximize gas exchange, that means air in, air out of the root zone. We're going to encourage rooting. Turf grass roots grow in air. Uh, I used to hear Dr. Street say this all the time. They grow in oxygen. And so we need oxygen in the soil. If we have waterlogged soils, we have compacted soils, the turf grass roots won't grow and they're not able to take up nutrients from that from that soil solution. And so um, we know about, about midsummer with our cool season grasses, when the soil temperatures get above 80 degrees at the four inch level, they lose about 50% of their root mass. Many of our grasses like perennial ryegrass, the grasses are very fibrous and almost like an annual plant. And so um, leading up to that midsummer stress period, we need to maximize that root growth. And I would just say again, um, and I've seen this on a lot of sports fields that mow very low. So field hockey, soccer, um, where you are trying to get one inch root swords for ball roll sports like field hockey and soccer. I see all too often those get overtaken with annual bluegrass uh, because they've, we've gone into this cycle of it's very shallow rooted. I have to keep it alive. And so I'm going to have to keep watering it and fertilizing it. And then gradually it, it completely takes over the entire field. So I know it's a fine line between, you know, uh, maximizing root growth, but also not wanting your field to get stressed out and die. If you do have a lot of annual bluegrass in there. Um, but this is what turf grass management's all about, right? We're, we're leading up to this stress period. And uh, this is the time that you rise to the challenge and you come up with these plans to go into the summer stress period with the deepest roots possible. So that's all I have today, Dr. Nangle. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela. And I, I just noticed that is a fabulous field in your background picture. So nicely done to emphasize that. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Shadler, any dead destruction and any other pestilence that you have on the inside? Uh, there's not much has, has happened since last week. Uh, the, the same, what I mentioned for the annual bluegrass weevil, uh, basically are at that point in time where there's still adults out, but there's also some larvae. So you need that probably a combination product, uh, something that either has one of the diamides or one of the neonics, rethroid. Uh, to uh, uh, control the annual bluegrass weevils at this time. It's really too early uh, for the, the white grubs, but I did want to point out that we do have one of our species of white grubs uh, that is uh, coming out in, in great abundance. This is the Falophaga, uh, the so-called May-June beetles. Uh, I, I find it interesting. There was a posting of these on, on the internet and uh, depending on where the people were, they say, well, we call them June bugs and, and others say, we call them May beetles. Well, both is okay. They, they, we're talking about the same thing. There's about three or four species. I ran my light trap last night and I got about 40, uh, of these beetles in the light trap. It was two species, uh, that, that were coming in. Uh, and we are seeing a few more of these. Uh, remember that our May June beetles here in Ohio take two years to complete their development. Uh, they actually, in the second year, the grubs mature in late August and September, 
and actually pupate at that time. And then they overwinter as adult beetles. So that's why they come out so early in the springtime is that they've been waiting in the soil as an adult beetle uh, to come out. What would be the time to, to treat these? Well, my feeling is, is your normal grub treatment time in, in that uh, June, July, August window. Uh, that's when the, the first instar uh, May, June beetle uh, larvae are gonna be there, but you might find the third instars for the second year ones uh, at that time. So sometimes I do get people sending me what looks like a fully mature white grub at the end of June. They say, what the heck is this? Uh, you know, shouldn't everything be, uh, uh, either eggs or, or not, and, and what they're sending me are the second year uh, of these May-June beetles. But uh, so that that's pretty much all I've got. Uh, uh, I think it's still a little bit too early for uh, chinch bugs, uh, where they're just barely beginning to wake up and, and start their activity. You're probably not going to see anything. Uh, the bill bugs uh, have been up and out, especially this week with the really warm weather. The adult bill bugs have been out. So you still have time to put down, uh, again, one of the diamides, uh, a celeprin, tetrino, ferenc, uh, one of those types of materials would be great for bill bugs and, and then give you the white grub control later on the season. If you're using nicotinoid, uh, if you use the short residual ones uh, like merit and, and meridian, uh, you're going to miss the white grubs, but if you use clothianidin or arena, we know that that has better staying power, and so you could get the bill bugs, and there'll be residual activity to to get the white grubs later on the season. Okay, that's that's my summary. I'm going to stick to it. Thank you, Dr. Scheller. Don't deviate at all, then you don't have to fall off that plank. Uh, a couple of things on my end uh, that popped up this weekend, so or this week, rolling. Uh, is it detrimental? Generally, we would say not, uh, but you're only going to get so much effect. And what I mean by that is that rolling, if soils have gotten very dry, is not going to do anything. Uh, and so this is mainly focused for the homeowners. Um, it's kind of a Goldilocks thing. It's not that there's a perfect uh, feeling or sensation in the soil that you need to have. Dr. Shetler is now sponsored by Dr. Pepper. Nice. Um, oh, I'm going to get in trouble with OSU for that. Uh, but the big thing is that you also need to have a piece of equipment that can pull the roller. If that's two legs and two arms, then so be it. But if you are using automatic equipment, make sure that you've got turf tires on it so you're not creating ruts because that's really going to cause a problem. The rolling itself, if it's a single pass or even two passes, the idea of causing excess compaction is not something we're overly concerned by. Um, the other thing that popped up this week was uh, somebody sent me an image of uh, a bag of nitrogen and they said, hey, I want to use this. Um, and I'm like, well, that's 29% nitrogen. Uh, that's going to lead you to maybe potentially bale hay. And uh, the only statement that I got back was, well, it says it's 0.6% water insoluble. And uh, that's all well and good. I would need that to be 26.6% before I would be comfortable with it. Um, what you're looking for in reality on the fertility side, if you're going to make that application, is a greater amount of slow release material. So water insoluble or something that specifically states on the label, water insoluble uh, or, or slow release uh, material. Reason being that if you put material down, uh, nitrogen down this time of year with higher amounts of N on the label, and, and maybe an image will be more appropriate, but your, your fertilizer bags are going to have three main macronutrient numbers, N, nitrogen, P, and K. Uh, anything above 15% at this time of year is probably going to lead to uh, a particularly fast release is probably going to lead to the need to mow three or four times a week to try and keep the stuff under control. So just be aware what you're buying and, and it's not necessarily a, a, a knock on any of the, the fertilizer companies. Of course, we're keeping our P's and Q's straight here. It's just a uh, greater focus on slow release materials because you will get some green up at most of these products initially and, and that's going to get that result you're looking for. But with that slow release component, as soils start to warm up, you're going to continue to get value from the product. So you get a sustained release of nitrogen and the continued greening. Um, with that- uh, Ed, Ed, what about, uh, you know, in, in the past, uh, some of the, the lawn care companies have spiked their uh, fertility at this time of the year with a little bit of iron. Uh, right. if, if you want to, I think, a faster green up without stimulating the, the growth, uh, see if you can find something that, that's low low in the, the nitrogen, but has some iron added to it. 
Yeah, absolutely, David. And uh, the one thing to keep in mind with iron is you are going to get a very quick response, which will include if you make a slightly uh, heavy application, it may get kind of pretty dark. Yeah, you can, uh, I've seen some black, what looked like black lawns were over application. <laughs> it, it won't, it, it doesn't mean you have to call the, the fire service. It's not going to burn in front of you. Uh, just give it a couple of days and it will darken up. And uh, that is a, a very appropriate approach at this time of year as well to reduce nitrogen input, but get that color bang for your buck. All right. Uh, with that, folks, uh, we will leave it and we will be back again next week. Uh, we hope to talk to you all soon. Thank you.